We got that roll forward, didn't it? Yeah. There's no exploding petrol tanks, and the Colosseum appears to have survived. It looked all right. Um, obviously, it's difficult to tell just from one angle, but it, it looked like it came down and, and tilted the way we wanted it to go. So we'll just wait while the dust clears. With the suits have to go back this afternoon. Despite all their worries, the Colosseum Cinema opened for business just four hours later. In the industrial badlands outside Philadelphia lies another condemned building. A massively strong concrete grain silo. No one could work out how it could be blown up until the British were called in. We need to move a siren blast one half minute. Now Moran and his team have flown in to see how preparations are going. To try and just drop this thing like a normal tower block would probably be a catastrophe. The thing just will not break up. It's an extremely strong building, much stronger than a normal high-rise tower block. That in itself gives us a problem. The bottom half of the building won't collapse because it's a system of silos that are infinitely rigid. Complicated even more by the fact that the two oil tanks, they're now actually a guy's business. He's running a, a workshop and a, a plant maintenance uh, company out there. So to tip the building over sideways would result in this thing being wiped out, probably. His plan is to blow the top half of the building clean off and then dismantle the rest using ball and chain. I've never done this before. We've done thousands of structures, but this is the first time that we've ever attempted anything like this. Is it going to work? Of course. To make sure that nothing is left of the top half, he's had to slice it vertically from end to end. We've actually cut a slot through the roof. All that's left is the reinforcement, which is tying the two halves of roof together now. What we'll be doing next is cutting this reinforcement, and we've done the same all the way down the building to the level where we're going to cut it off of the top of the silos. When we detonate the explosives and blow the legs out down below, this half of the building will disappear that way, and this half of the building will disappear that way, we hope. 150 feet up on the blast floor, a local blaster has the job of preparing the columns for the explosives. But it's just 24 hours to go, and Fred Nichols is behind. I don't think it'll be much into the evening. Uh, we should not have to do much work after dark. You thing is, pressure on you, Fred. But. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I probably won't sleep much tonight anyway, so I might as well be here walking these things five or six times as in a bed tossing and turning. I guess that's the difference between us and you. We sleep really well knowing you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have these things wrapped by dark, by eight hours from now. We have got five left to wrap, assuming they finish that one in just a few minutes. In the sub-zero temperatures, work is going slowly. On the roof, it's time for the most dangerous moment before the explosion. Cutting through the last few metal rods that hold the top half of the building together. Mick Williams is in charge. This is the final separation through the building now, just finishing off, putting all the reinforcing bar. We've um, done the rest right up to the roof now, and this is the final cut through. There's a possibility because of the back weight from the small columns that the floor could start to sag a bit. There's some tension in the bars now, and it is starting to sag down at the far end. You can see from the floor 
dropped down about the thickness of the slab, which is about between four and five inches. Would you stand on it? No, I don't think that's a very good idea. The top half is now balanced precariously on columns they've deliberately weakened 150 feet below on the blast floor. This is the, the short section of the roof that's heading in that direction. These columns behind me have... You've got to be fairly sure that these columns are not going to fail prematurely, because if they do, this whole thing's just going to sit straight down. If that happens, then we've got a major problem, because we've got something that is effectively a free structure, but it's sat on top of another one 100-odd feet tall and no way to get at it to deal with it. US blaster Fred Nichols still has hundreds of sticks of explosive to put in place and connect up. It's just dynamite. This is approximately a half a pound. One stick in each hole, and we've got seven holes in this outside row. The blast is set for 8 a.m. With daylight already fading, Moran is worried. How much charging is the left in total and how many? The top's here and then all the outside columns are overhead. And I'm going to try to be coming right behind them with the, uh, with the hookups. What happens if you run out of daylight? We've got a light flat. Dang. It will be done. Handling explosives in daylight is dangerous enough. To get the job done, Moran orders Mick Williams to help. Now, I think there's approximately 80 holes still to charge, so a good few hours' work, yeah. We'll be here all night, these guys, at the rate they're going. As you can see, the work rate is diminishing somewhat, as it usually does when it gets to be dark at this time of night. You know, but they've got it to finish because they, uh, the show's got to go on at 8 o'clock in the morning, so they'll just have to work until it's ready. It's quite eerie in the last sort of 30 minutes. There's a, usually a silence that is unnatural because there's always noise and, and people moving around no matter what time of the day, but sort of a once in a lifetime, uh, everything stops, everybody's moved out and it is totally still. And it's almost uh, as if the birds and the wildlife know it as well, they always seem to be quiet. Everything now depends on Moran's theory working and the building splitting in half. Until you actually see it, there's just that niggling doubt that there might be something that we've missed.
anybody can drill a hole and put explosives in it. And, you know, they can put too much, they can put too little, or they can get lucky and do it just right. But there is no substitute for experience. No, clean as a whistle. Another textbook job for the Brits, huh? Back in Yorkshire, and with two successes under his belt, Moran now makes plans to blow up a massive block in the heart of London. Everything I do in my life, that I do well, it's because it's a challenge. I get into trouble at home because everything has to be turned into a competition. If it's, I don't know, walking, a, a long distance challenge walking, I've done that. And it's, it's got to be something that at the end of it you can say yes. In Hackney, the 19-storey concrete block is hemmed in by shops and houses. Well, it's a bit of an eyesore. It's always been um, a disadvantage to the area. It's been used as, as a brothel. It's been used as uh, for homeless. It's been used for all sorts of um, people. But um, I'll be perfectly honest, I'll be glad to see the back of it. Very high building there, so I don't know how. You can even finish up in the main road, if you ask me. The man who's working out the exact method to destroy it is Moran's structural engineer, Bob Johnson. Tough job, very difficult job. The building itself is precast concrete panels. This building has been put up like the biggest Lego building in the world. Blocks built upon blocks. They are inherently very, very strong indeed. So what we wish to do is to break the building up in flight before it hits the deck. And the way we do that is to put staged detonation delays in. They want the explosives on the right-hand side to blow first. A third of a second later, the central section, and then the left side should go. It's a delicate science. We pre weak all of the walls that are in there, take large sections of walls out so we can drill holes to put the explosives in. And if you like, we're standing here a day before blowdown. Uh, I'm the happiest man in the world. I'm the most relieved engineer in the world because we've taken 50% of the structure away and the building hasn't fallen down. As well as the demolition, there's an added problem. Nearly a thousand people living in the danger zone around the building. Quite a few of the uh, occupants of the domestic dwellings are elderly people whose only memories of explosives are from the Second World War. So they've, they've been extremely concerned and they've needed uh, a lot of uh, comfort, really. I threaten them that unless they make adequate arrangements for the safety of my property, I would not be vacating. I had a meeting with three of the powers that be, and it was agreed that the house would be sheeted, the windows would be protected. Hackney Council is in charge of the evacuation. Have people been coming to the shop asking questions? About the windows, yeah. What they're doing, or...? Well, no, it's the protection of the windows. As far as I, I heard, we're going to shut the windows and they're going to put, uh, like, uh, plastic material outside in front of the other side so that there's no dust coming there. There is a window replacement programme taking place at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying we want to bring it forward. Can he start Sunday? It starts today, I think. I've noticed in their literature they have a gang of glaziers standing by, they have a gang of carpenters standing by. Um, when queried, well, just in case. With so much at stake, Moran personally checks every detail. See, that's what bothers me, stuff like that. It's all over here. When this comes down, there's going to be a big push of air. It'll be right up into those bloody windows. On the last day when I turn up, it's seen as an absolute disaster if I've managed to find anything, because they're trying their best to make absolutely certain that there is nothing for me to find. Because if there's one thing that's found that's not right, everybody feels as if they've, they've let me win. Some of this stuff is stupid. I mean, all I've done is just wasted time and geotextile doing that. I mean, that's yeah. just crap. 
We ought to send him a bill for it. It needs doing again, that. It needs doing properly. That looks like something I've wrapped up. Before dawn on blast day, work starts to create a huge evacuation zone around the building. <laughs> then the delicate task of coaxing a thousand men, women, children and pets out of their homes begins. Hi, London Borough Hackney. Are you ready to go? Sorry? Are you ready to leave? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. The guy over this side from Two Branfields, he doesn't appear to have an exit card and he doesn't speak very good English. Over. <laughs> It's best to remove them. With cats, if they get out and get into the area, it'd be awful. We've got a dog here as well. At the moment, we've got 26 booked in, but you can guarantee that's going to go higher. Hello. What a What a service. Hello. Well, you get a free breakfast. Yes, that's what I'm off to now. Oh, definitely. Sausage, egg, chips. Hello, anybody in the bedroom? Very dead, very dead. Have you got you're not sure about? Yeah, these two, number one and number two. And number 29. <laughs> That's called the Hackney eviction knock. There is finally just one property unaccounted for, and it's one of the closest to the building. They can't take a chance that there isn't someone hiding inside. Okay. The flat is empty. The blast can go ahead. Fifteen thousand tons of concrete reduced to a neat pile in five seconds. And in the surrounding buildings, not a single broken window. You know that we're the masters of understatement, don't we? I rest my case. 
What do you want? So what did you predict would happen? What, what did you Just predict? that. What was the intention? The well, intention uh, was to bring it this way, away from the shops. That's what it's done. I mean, it's... Uh, we've talked to you about it all bloody week. Haven't you been listening? One of our better days at the office.